Thank you. Thank you for the, for the very kind words. Um, I am, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the All India State Bank Officers Federation and uh, also the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies of JNU for making this possible, for mm -hmm. extending the invitation and, uh, and, uh, uh, and for the kind uh, hospitality. Uh, this is indeed a, um, a, a, an honor to be giving uh, this lecture, this third uh, uh, God Body lecture. Um, it is a real privilege to be giving this in his name. I have uh, read uh, the book that was uh, written on the trade unions, the State Bank uh, Officers uh, Federation, and find great inspiration in uh, Comrade uh, Godboli's uh, revolutionary spirit and commitment to trade unionism uh, in this country. Um, I uh, will speak today in a very general topic uh, entitled Late Neocolonialism, Monopoly Capitalism in Permanent Crisis. Uh, I will start with uh, the permanent crisis bit uh, to try to situate um, the, the, the situation at present. The, um, one of the most remarkable features of the world economy over the last 50 years or more is the fact that um, the rate of profit has been in the productive sectors has been in constant decline at the center of the world economy. This is since 1965. There has been a partial recovery uh, from 82 to 97, at two-thirds the level of 1965. Then another recovery in 2006, back up to 1997 levels, followed by a sharp fall during the 2008 crisis, down to one-third of the 1965 level, followed by another partial and always weaker recovery. So this is generally, uh, this makes for a very long systemic crisis, which needs to be recognized as such. Uh, a crisis punctuated by crashes and recessions, which in some countries have been experienced as depressions, comparable to the conditions obtaining after 1929 with dramatic losses in GDP of up to 30% and unemployment levels surpassing 20%. After 1965, and especially after the crisis of the 1970s, an Herculean effort was undertaken on all fronts to recuperate profits. This epic exercise, encapsulated in the term neoliberalism, had included several elements. I will, I will just uh, mention the principal elements. There are about seven. First, it entailed the unraveling of the Bretton Woods agreements on capital controls and monetary relations, which hitherto had permitted a measure of stability. The end of Bretton Woods freed, uh, freed US firms from so-called financial repression and served their quest for outward expansion by enhancing their sources and volume of finance in the uh, burgeoning capital markets. It also freed the US dollar from its prior obligations to other currencies, transforming it into a mere claim on US debt, impossible to redeem, but still extraordinary in its capacity to absorb the world's savings. It also positioned Wall Street um, at the center of the system to recycle global capital flows far above all other uh, financial centers, thereby consolidating the capacity of the leading capitalist state to finance its deficits with hardly any constraints and to finance, to finance its own monopolies as well as those of others. The second element, beyond the unraveling of Bretton Woods, 
was the expansion of capital exports by the monopolies among advanced economies, but also, and more remarkably, given historical experience, to the peripheries, where today the bulk of industrial labor takes place, in fact, especially in two countries, China and India. The third element is the continuation of rapid technological leaps via the so-called third and fourth industrial revolutions, which have boosted overall the organic composition of capital, such as by the application of robotics and artificial intelligence, while also creating the logistical capabilities to deepen globalized production and global value systems across industry and agriculture. Fourth uh, is the rapid advance of mergers and acquisitions across all sectors, industry, agriculture, mining, banking, insurance, communications, and other services, with monopolies gaining ground upstream and downstream of production to install what Samir Amin had called generalized monopolies. Fifth is the financialization of profits, whereby industrial firms have themselves become dependent on financial profits against industri industrial profits, and where debt has ballooned among corporations, governments, and households, especially in the USA and other major uh, economies, with the active support of monetary authorities, to the point even of obtaining negative interest rates today across a dozen countries to no good effect. We can indeed speak of the inauguration of an enduring and systemic financialization logic, what uh, uh, um, John Bellamy Foster has called monopoly finance capital, whose objective is a, the perpetuation of a wealth effect uh, that is the systemic inflation of asset prices to sustain profits and monopoly capitalism itself. Sixth uh, is the escalation of primitive accumulation in both centers and peripheries, but especially in the peripheries, where it has a far longer history. This is where the value of the world's key currencies is anchored, as Prabhat Patnaik and Nutsa Patnaik have so eloquently argued, and which constantly threaten uh, to squeeze profits, puncture bubbles, and bring the wealth effect to an end. Primitive accumulation takes a number of forms, from the more visible land grabs and green grabs, to the deepening of super exploitation by the offloading of the cost of social reproduction onto the expanding labor reserves themselves and onto women in particular. This is a system that depends more and more on, 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 on unpaid labor. Not only uh, is it not costed as uh, variable capital or unproductive labor in Marx's terms, in fact, it is not accounted for in any way in the market, given that it is not remunerated in any way. So if the, organ if the organic composition of capital is growing and, and the profit rate shrinking, the appropriation of labor by other means must also grow to keep profits from dropping further. And indeed, if we interrogate closely the structure of peripheral social formations, Today, we will see ongoing tendencies of proletarianization, but also, and more so, the growth of own account work in the informal sectors, and a scramble for social reproduction, which, ad which adds pressure onto existing gender hierarchies. We will encounter a workforce with an unstable, periodic, and episodic relation to wage labor, in constant flux, with no chance of obtaining wage stability or making a clean break from agriculture. 
This is what we have been seeking to conceptualize as a semi-proletarianized social formation, a concept which finds inspiration um, in Mao's understanding of the semi-proletariat as elaborated nearly 100 years ago in his 1926 analysis of classes in Chinese society. I will return to this. The final element that needs to be highlighted uh, in this uh, systemic crisis and in this epic exercise to recuperate profits is the escalation of war spending even after the end of the Cold War, whose objective is to guarantee that monopoly finance capital meets no resistance in any corner of the earth and that the US state remains its main patron. The USA spends far more on war preparation and war making than all other major powers combined. It is perhaps no surprise that Donald Trump has caused a stir in NATO by demanding that the others start paying up. Yes. Okay, having uh, very schematically uh, outlined the features of this systemic, this long systemic crisis. Um, what will concern us next and for the rest of this talk are precisely the modes of political domination of monopoly capitalism with a view to formulate some basic political questions at the current juncture. In fact, we should continue to ask what is the current state of national liberation under the neoliberal assault on nations, labor, women, and uh, natural resources in the environment. If intensified primitive accumulation and permanent war, more, war, permanent war are the hallmarks of neoliberalism, we must return in a focused manner to the question of liberation. Um, it is important to acknowledge at the outset that even in the centers of the system, liberal democracy with universal suffrage does not have a long history. This political form of monopoly capitalism entered into force only after the First World War to flourish <clears throat> in the early post-war period. It is now in deep crisis as fascism has clawed its way back to parliaments and institutions. It remains important to demystify liberal democracy at the center, first by recognizing that its contradiction with fascism is non-antagonistic, given that monopoly capitalism has only superficial commitment to liberal democracy. Under liberal democracy, monopoly capitalism opposes fascism, but typically by the theory of the two extremes, whereby it defends liberal democracy as a solution not only to fascism, but also to the radical left. Yet, it is only the radical left that presents a challenge to monopoly capitalism. Hence, the tolerance that monopoly capitalism and its liberals tend to show towards fascism when push, when push comes to shove, and hence, the typical swing to far-right positions, especially on immigration and war, as they compete with fascism. But liberal democracy, democracy is hardly the main mode of political domination under monopoly capitalism. Monopoly capitalism has relied for its survival, not on liberal democracy, but on colonial forms of political domination including colonies of exploitation, colonies of, settle of settlement, as well as, as, well as semi-colonies, these, th these three being the basic modes of colonial, historically, of colonial domination. Until the 1960s, liberal democracy at the center had a very direct relationship, and this is at the apex of liberal democracy with all colonial modes of domination. 
Thereafter, the world system as a whole made the transition to a neo-colonial mode of rule, enabled by the economic mechanisms of monopoly capitalism, combined with imperialist war, and the systematic political support given to reactionary forces in the peripheries in the interest of preserving the sway of monopoly capital and its access to tropical agricultures, natural resources, and cheap labor. Neocolonialism is a system that Kwame Nkrumah famously identified as the last stage of imperialism. Now, it is important to uh, differentiate and periodize neocolonialism itself. When Kwame Nkrumah wrote, he was still writing at an early phase. Uh, neocolonial rule has always had great difficulty, to state the obvious, in reconciling itself with the liberal democratic form of politics. The question of a national democratic revolution, as understood in the West in the 19th and early 20th century, has remained an ongoing struggle in the neocolonial in the neocolonial peripheries. Uh, so, uh, it is important now to make this distinction between early and late neocolonialism and push further on anal our analysis of this final stage of imperialism. In early neocolonialism, independence was a concession extracted from monopoly capitalism by the anti-colonial movements by means of political and armed struggle in a Cold War context. This forced the strategic repositioning of monopoly capitalism at that time in its social democratic phase at the center. Recall again that Kwame Nkrumah identified the logic of neocolonialism as being precisely the survival of the welfare state at the center. It enabled the drain of surplus to continue from the peripheries to the center and to compensate Western workers while freeing the center of responsibility for the consequences of this strategy. In that strategic shift, Social democracy, with few notable exceptions, gave support to reactionary forces in the peripheries, to settlers and dictatorships against radical nationalisms in the peripheries or any, indeed, nationalism that would not bow its head to the monopolies. In effect, U.S. and Western trade unionisms played good cop, bad cop with the liberation aspirations of the peoples of the third world. Yet in early neocolonialism, a number of peripheral states were sufficiently radicalized to retain substantial autonomy and sustain an anti-imperialist po posture in the spirit of Bandung without succumbing immediately to neocolonial rule. And in fact, we may even extend slightly the argument, nationalism in the liberated peripheries generally still showed a commitment to social and economic development, even if it remained deficient in democratic content, and even, if, even when it gravi gravitated to the Western camp. Its legitimacy stemmed from promises made and partly delivered to the large peasant populations uh, as well as from the restoration of national and civilizational dignity. Whether radical or moderate, the nationalist momentum was sustained for a considerable amount of time in some countries, especially those that gained independence earlier. But the tables were turned again in the 1970s as world economic stagnation and the, date, the debt crisis struck. Additionally, there was also a significant number of juridically independent peripheral states that did not make the transition to neocolonialism at this time, did not participate in Bandung or share its ideals, 
even if they, they, even if they displayed interest in the development of the productive forces internally. These were the white settler states of Southern Africa and Latin America, which remained in the settler colonial mode of political domination long after they obtained juridical independence from the British or Iberian metropolis. Generally, and with some notable exceptions, uh, the neo-colonial transition in these regions occurred precisely in the neoliberal period under late neocolonialism, when minority rule and military regimes were defeated and universal suffrage was finally consolidated. Overall, overall, it is evident, I'm looking at the time, but it's okay, yeah? Overall, it is evident that the definitive end to five centuries of European colonial domination transformed the, periphery, the peripheries of the world economy into independent states, but also into generalized conflict zones, both in the Cold War and after. Properly speaking, this transition has been an ongoing third world war in both of the possible senses of the term, a third imperialist world war and a war against the third world. And it could only be so given that its emergence from the shackles of colonialism raised the stakes for monopoly capitalism as well as for Soviet communism for other reasons. It is equally important to note, in relation to early neocolonialism, that in that global systemic rivalry, rivalry between East, West, and South, the Bandung movement was the most basic force of anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. There was nothing comparable, of course, in the centers of the world economy, nothing comparable in, as a political force or a social force uh, there uh, to the Bandung movement. In fact, the Bandung movement was born as a world peace and justice movement in the ex-colonies of Asia and Africa. And even if armed struggle inevitably was adopted in the 60s, in the 60s across the South, several places across the South, <clears throat> the Bandung spirit and the non-aligned movement that in incarnated it remained the most basic civilizing force in the world of that time. It should have been expected, and I will come back to this, that its demise would have severe consequences for both, both centers and peripheries. Now, late neocolonialism is the, is the result of this historic stalemate. The early phase of neo early neocolonialism stalled. There was, it wasn't superseded by uh, a new phase of deeper liberation. Uh, the elements of late neocolonialism include, on the one hand, the global national sovereignty regime already in place, but also the demise of Bandung and the rise of neoliberalism. To this we might add, of course, the implosion of the Soviet bloc. Late neocolonialism in the peripheries also corresponds politically to the neoliberal phase of liberal democracy at the center. We are no lo longer ta talking about the social democracy of the past. Under late neocolonialism, monopoly finance capital has escalated once again the economic drain from the peripheries, but this time with declining compensation to the working classes at the center. Under late neocolonialism, monopoly capitalism has continued to intervene and to manipulate conflict situations in the peripheries, wreaking havoc across whole regions and inventing new strategic enemies now couched in the apocalyptic terms of terror and evil, 
to justify permanent war and the curtailment, in fact, of civil liberties at home. In the peripheries, late neocolonialism has been marked by the degeneration of nationalism under the weight of the deepening compadorization of peripheral bourgeoisies. These bourgeoisies have essentially seceded from the nation, as Prabhat Patnaik has put it. This period has, become, has been accompanied by accelerated rural exodus, the dramatic expansion of informal and vulnerable employment, and the generalized process of semi-proletarianization. Two further points now uh, need to be made about late neocolonialism, and this, uh, with this I, I will conclude. The first concerns the fraying of the national sovereignty regime by the return of semi-colonialism as a mode of political domination. The second, I will explain what that is. The second concerns the rise of fascism in both North and South. These are features of this late phase of neocolonialism. Both are attributable to the stalemate of the neocolonial transition and the attrition against the social and political gains of national independence. So what are the challenges of late, neocol late neocolonialism? If the return of fascism <clears throat> has been gaining significant attention today, and I will return to this, the semi-colonial situation as such has not. The semi-colonial situation may be called a number of other names in the literature, in the political analyses, but has not been consolidated analytically into a phenomenon that pertains to neoliberalism and late neocolonialism. In fact, in our 2011 book on reclaiming the nation, which uh, uh, Archana mentioned, uh, we identified several trajectories of peripheral states under neoliberalism, excluding China, uh, two of which were, in retrospect, clearly semi-colonial situations. But we also did not take the conceptual stride at that time to call them as such. Now, recall that Lenin and his, and his contemporaries had used the term semi-colonialism, but had not developed it. The concept received the most systematic exposition by the Chinese Communist Party in the writings of Mao, who referred to it substantively at least three times. In 1926, in 1939, and 1941, in some classic texts. I won't uh, uh, name them here. Perhaps uh, resuming uh, the two most important elements, to my mind, that required attention, um, uh, they are as follows. First, that this mode of political domination, semi-colonialism, cannot be detached from a specific underlying mode of accumulation, which in the, in the Chinese case was understood as semi-feudal, not properly capitalist, that is based on extra economic co coercion and on exchanges not accounted for by the market. Presently, the escalation of primitive accumulation, I would argue, has served a similar function, albeit, albeit without any feudalism or much feudalism left to speak of. Two, uh, the second uh, uh, element, beyond the various means of control exercised by the foreign monopolies and states over such territories, uh, at the time that Mao was writing, there was also a partial seizure of territory by means of... <coughs> Fascism emerges in opposition to liberal democracy, when monopoly capitalism enters into crisis. <clears throat>
And of course, monopoly capitalism is now in permanent crisis, as I argued above. The second point is that fascism consists in the categorical, categorical rejection of liberal democracy and liberal democratic spaces. Fascism proposes to provide unity and salvation by rescuing traditions corrupted and undermined by liberal democracy. The traditions are those of the family, and of racial or caste identity, or ethnic or religious identities, which become subject to racialization. The enemies of tradition are to be segregated and even exterminated, not just co-opted or assimilated as under liberalism. Fascism is avowedly supremacist. The third point in this relation, in relation to this, is that fascism emerged in the 20th century at the centers of monopoly capitalism in response to the crisis of capitalism at that time and its catastrophic wars. Uh, recall perhaps that uh, uh, Paul Sweezy uh, had uh, pointed out that the wars the First World War in particular was so catastrophic that it had laid the basis uh, in certain societies, especially Germany, those that were mostly destroyed by the war, uh, uh, created the, the conditions for uh, fascism to rise. So it is the result of a catastrophic event. But reading that, that chapter in his book uh, on the development of capitalism, he also left open the possibility of a prolonged crisis recreating such catastrophic conditions. And I believe we are now in, that, in this type of situation. Yeah. The peripheries, in those days, 100 years ago, uh, remained under colonial rule when fascism emerged. Um, and therefore, the emergence of fascism was necessarily also a force for world domination, vying for the repartition of spheres of influence and supremacy over the world economy. Now, the transition to neocolonialism and its stalemate has created conditions for both fascism, for fascism in both North and South, but they are not the, the same type entirely of fascism. In the peripheries, the contemporary assertion of fascism, insofar as it exists, it doesn't exist everywhere, must be located precisely in this transition uh, to late neocolonialism, corresponding to the demise of Bandung and the rise of neoliberalism, and has fed on contradictions that in any case survived the neocolonial transition uh, and the colonial experience. The assertion of fascism in the peripheries today is different, I would argue, from that of the center on at least three counts. First, it is limited to the nation or at most to regional disputes, having no conditions to vie for world domination. Yeah. But it seeks alignment for its own survival and expansion with monopoly capital at the center thereby becoming an instrument, itself an instrument, in the struggle for world domination. This explains why, or at least partly why, it remains so committed to neoliberalism in its economics. Now, fascism in the peripheries, especially, even in the centers, but in the, in the, especially in the peripheries, uh, is, is very thoroughly neoliberal, until this point at least, Maybe it'll, something will happen, but until this point, this is what really uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, differentiates it. Walden Bello, you might know, um, has written a book called, on uh, 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 this issue, it's called The Counter-Revolution or something. Uh, actually, he's made a, a very strong distinction between fascism in, in, the, in the center and fascism in the periphery. Uh, on the one hand, pointing out that in the peripheries it's very neoliberal, and in the centers, uh, 
arguing that it's not so neoliberal. Um, but anyway, the third uh, difference is that fascistic forces take advantage of liberal spaces to gain ground through elections and so forth, as always, uh, to gain ground on the new social and political terrain ushered in by generalized semi-proletarianization. So the social and political terrain is different. On these new conditions, the Bandung nationalism of the past is being overtaken by fundamentalist Christianity, especially in Latin America, the evangelical churches, uh, fundamentalist Islam and fundamentalist Hinduism, all of which are seeking actively and receiving the support of monopoly capital um, at the center. Now, to conclude, in the centers, the resurgence of fascism advances again within liberal politics, as well as in, on the terrain of a degraded and insecure working class, the so-called middle class, which is essentially, and I'm not exaggerating, devoid of world historical consciousness. While we search for answers, strategies, and alliances, uh, it remains crucial to emphasize that monopoly capitalism and its fascistic tendencies will not be defeated unless genuine solidarity of workers and peoples across North and South takes root. But as a matter of historical record, it is also crucial to recognize that it was a destruction of the Bandung movement under social democracy at the center and the consolidation of neocolonialism that paved the way for the resurgence of fascism at the center itself. As Malcolm X once remarked, the chickens have come home to roost. Thank you. <laughs>